so glad you're able to join us this morning. How are you? Now please do let us know here at Rosedale if you've got any news to share or prayer requests. And please do keep praying for each other. Several members of our church family have suffered bereavements this week and times are really tough for many, many of our folk and our neighbours. You know, with so many infections and deaths, most of us have been affected in one way or another. I'm kind of reminded really that we regularly use the Psalms as a call to worship on a Sunday morning and often of course we choose verses of joy and hope but part part of the beauty of the Psalms is that they also provide us with words to express our grief and lament like chapter 39 and verse 12 where the psalmist writes this Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. And you know, there are many among us giving voice to those cries today. And of course, God answers. Jesus himself says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He doesn't say he will take away the grief, but he does promise to be with the brokenhearted and those who who are crushed in spirit. So shall we pray? Shall we begin this morning just by praying for those who are grieving today? Heavenly Father, we do not understand these days in which we live, but we know that you do. We grieve with our church family, our friends, neighbours and those in our nation who are mourning and have lost loved ones. We ask that you extend your grace, your mercy, your love and compassion to them. Hear the cries of those who are weeping today and those who are calling for help. Please answer them, draw near to them, bring your comfort and your peace and show us how we can love and support them. We pray. Amen. Amen. And so we are gathered this morning knowing that that collectively we're feeling both grief and sorrow, but also we come feeling hope and our trust in God. And we give thanks that we can worship him today. And of course, we will be joining together on Zoom at 11 a.m. for fellowship and to discuss this message. So if you're available, please do join us. Well, our message this morning continues our present topic on Ephesians 5 verse 18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Last week we looked at how the Holy Spirit moves upon us and comes to dwell in us when we surrender our lives to God. Today we're looking at a topic that has so many different interpretations and thoughts and doctrines and experience about it and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now can I just say up front that there is no way I can possibly cover every angle but I am hoping that what we do talk about today will spark a hunger for God in your spirit. So let's go to Sheila for our Bible reading this morning. Thank you, Sheila. Chapter four, commencing at verse 23, the believers prayer. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats 
and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they meet, were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of the Lord boldly. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. That's great. A powerful passage of scripture that we're going to be coming back to in just a few moments. But first of all, I'm delighted to say that we have another testimony. Now, this testimony is from Paul. Paul was my pastor for the six years that I lived in Belfast from 1996 to 2002. He's a man of God and Paul's preaching and his example has been a huge influence on my life. And actually, I still seek out today um, both Paul and his wife Priscilla's messages. I follow them on YouTube um, now because because of the wisdom and the integrity that Paul has. And so he's going to share with us now just a very small part of his story. Good morning, my name is Paul Reed from Belfast and Bethany has asked me to talk to you a little bit about my experience of the Holy Spirit. I come from a brethren background uh, Plymouth Brethren, you might know them as. And so we were very staunchly in the the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for today camp. In fact, it was worse than that. It was the gifts of the Spirit are of the devil. So when the, I suppose when the charismatic movement broke in the 70s, uh, there was a, a great deal of teaching among brethren assemblies about this issue. And as a, a budding boy preacher, I did my part in taking youth weekends and telling people how to stay well away from baptism in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy and all that other nonsense. Uh, I suppose the change came for me when uh, my sister went away in a YWAM DTS and came back and was evidently changed. Something had happened to her and she talked about the Holy Spirit, which we were really frightened of. We started our, our own church in 1981 and we were you know, as we would say, we were the only non-charismatic house church in the world. Uh, and we began to study scripture, look at First Corinthians, etc. And I think we came to the point where we, we actually said, we, we don't know why we have believed that the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, because there's no biblical mandate uh, that, would, that would teach that. And so we became convinced biblically that spiritual gifts and and I suppose a second experience of the Holy Spirit, we, we were very uncomfortable with the term baptism in the Spirit. Uh, but uh, we, we said, you know, this is valid for some people, but not for us. And in, in the course of our uh, little house church, uh, I, you know, we, we were, it was a really special time. And as we cried out to God, um, we just simply made ourselves available and said, Lord, look, if there's anything we're missing or anything that you have for our lives uh, that we're not open to, we want to be open to that. I remember driving along uh, and listening to scripture and song and the, the, one of the songs came up, it was Jeremiah, call unto me uh, and uh, call unto me and, and I will answer you and show you great and wondrous things that thou knowest not. I remember the Holy Spirit, I felt say to me, you know, if you call out to me and you seek me, I won't hold anything back. So we then as a little group, there was about a dozen of us, we went to Spring Harvest in 1981, uh, 83 actually, and I decided to go to the seminars on the Holy Spirit. Now, come from a Brethren background, why we had left the Brethren, still a lot of judgment you know, uh, in our approach, uh, critical, and I suppose in one sense, you know, is this biblical? So I, I went along, it was it was 10 o'clock in the morning, it was freezing, we were in a tent, and there was a couple of hundred people there, and the speaker was Rob White, and he stood up and he said, 
let me tell you my story. And he said, I was brethren and proud of it. And for some reason, I burst into tears. And, and I thought, what's going on here? And he told the story how that he was a manager of a store in South London. And they had hired a, 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 a travelling man from the travelling community to be their doorman. And he had he was obviously Pentecostal. And Rob said, because he was, Rob was brethren, he took great delight in putting him down at every occasion. And through a series of events, he had, he had to humble himself, invite the, the, door, the man on the door to come up to his office. Rob knelt down and got him to lay his hands on Rob's head. And Rob said life was never the same again. Eventually, Rob became a leader of Youth for Christ in, in England and then went on to pastor a Baptist church. And that really fascinated me. And then he just said out of the blue, look, if you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, would you stand up? And uh, to my amazement, I found myself standing on my feet. I think it was the second time in my life I'd ever done that. It wasn't something in our tradition. And I stood up and, uh, and he said, well, look, I can't pray for you all because there's too many. Why don't I just play my guitar and I'll ask God to move in your life? And he, he, he got his guitar, he had a few notes and I began to speak in, I suppose, a language that I had never heard before. So I, I quickly uh, I thought to myself, oh, I don't think I believe in this. And I felt the Lord say to me, you know, I got this strong impression, you know, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and wonderful things that you that thou knowest not. And I felt the Lord say, this is a fulfillment of that. And it was just a few words, but they, they were, they came into my head and I, I spoke them out. I mean, I wasn't shouting, it was just a quiet whisper, but you know, something, something had happened to me. And, and I, after the seminar was over, I rushed back to the chalet and I told Priscilla, my wife, what had happened. And, and then she, she was delighted initially. And then I nipped into the bathroom to see if I could do it again because I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but I, I'd looking back on it, I would say that I was baptised in the Spirit, which I put down as a as a separate and distinct experience of conversion, although ideally should happen almost simultaneously, as it did in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Uh, but I've been a Christian for, by that stage, 15 years. And, you know, when, when the same people who you, you know and respect and teach you say, you know, Jesus I was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again, ascended into heaven, and the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. You take it as a package. Uh, but I had to get my head around it and say, Lord, here I am, I'm available. I suppose I went from, it isn't for today, it's of the devil. Well, it might be for today, but it's not for me. Well, maybe it might be for me to, Lord, anything you have for me. And, and it, that experience changed my life. Um, I, I suppose for me it was, I still preached the same way, but this time uh, people got saved and God ushered me into a new quality of life. My wife describes it as having seen life in a, a movie in black and white and then suddenly it flips into Technicolor. And that's what happened to me. Uh, I, I remember I, it was a bit of a struggle because Priscilla, Priscilla's mum and dad, brother and folks all their lives and I remember as thing time went on Priscilla was struggling my one night she said to me we were I'd just gone to bed and she said what are you doing and I said I'm praying and she said are you praying in tongues I said yes she said well don't do it in bed with me so it was a bit tense because she said well my dad has as a godly man and he's never spoken in tongues or done anything like this so, you know, if he hasn't, maybe there's something suspicious about it. Whenever I told Priscilla's father, he then said to me, when he was in the brethren, one night he decided to stay up uh, and pray all night. He was a young man. He said he was 19. And as he said, he sat in his little kitchen house. He said the room was filled with light and he was filled with inexpressible joy, which he said lasted for days. He said he never experienced anything like it. So he had had his own spiritual experiences, although he put a different label and a different name on them. 
um, eventually Priscilla, we had a, in our house group, we, we, I, I taught in the spirit. I didn't really know much, but I knew to lay hands on people. And one night Priscilla was up feeding a newborn baby of ours, Susan, in 1984. And she was praying for someone, ran out of things to say, and she began to speak in other tongues. So uh, tongues have become a, a regular part of my prayer life. And the, I found that uh, it, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, tongues, they edify yourself. It, it, you know, all the other gifts are for other people, but tongues is one of them. Part of it is that it builds your own spirit up. That, that you, as, you, as you bypass uh, your understanding and you speak in tongues, it has the, it has the, the purpose of, of building you up. So th that's my experience. I began to listen, read. I think the key issue was being open. And saying, Lord, whatever you whatever you want, and and not excluding anything. I think I went through a period where I would say, Lord, well, I, I went to I went to a charismatic meeting and I didn't really fancy it much. And I thought it was a bit weird. And I said, Lord, well, could I have all of that without that? And and you have to battle your way through that and simply come to a place in your life where you say, Father, I am open and willing and ready to receive anything that you have for me. So it's, it's been a few years now. Uh, I suppose it's coming up on 40 years and it's been the most fantastic life. So listen, God bless you. Hope this has been helpful in some way and I pray God's blessing on this series and on your church. God bless you. Bye. Thank you, Paul. I so appreciate you sharing your encounter with God, the Holy Spirit, and may he continue to bless you and empower you. Now, the testimony you heard took place in the early 1980s. When Paul and Priscilla had started a church in their home, they had about 15 people. But when I joined the church in 1996, it was numbering 800. And God was moving powerfully upon the congregation and out into the surrounding community. For Paul and the other leaders, walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and all that God had for them was essential. Essential for fulfilling the vision and the commission of proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. So let's have a look at what the Bible says about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think one of the reasons there's so much confusion about it is because both Paul and Luke in the scriptures use the phrase, but they use it slightly differently. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 13, Paul writes this. Just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so is Christ. For in one spirit, we are, were all baptised into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Now here in this passage in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is actually talking about conversion. This is what we covered last week. And when we are saved at the moment of conversion, we receive the Holy Spirit of God. That's what he means about us all being baptised into the one spirit. And the one spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives us all new life, that eternal life. He is our seal and guarantee of being members of God's family forever. And that's what Paul is talking about, as about us being baptised into the spirit. However, Luke's use of the phrase is very slightly different. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, Luke records Jesus as saying this. And while staying with them, he, Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, in that passage in Acts 1, Jesus is talking to the disciples. They've already committed to following him, the Messiah, the risen Christ. 
And so this baptism that Jesus is talking about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it isn't, it isn't the conversion experience from unbelief to belief because the disciples were already born again, they were already committed followers of Jesus, and they already knew that they had eternal life in him. Instead, they are meeting together, they're studying the scriptures, they're praying, they're seeking God. And what they are waiting for is the promised power of God that will equip them to be witnesses, witnesses for Jesus, witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, witnesses with the Holy Spirit power that means that when they speak, people really hear. When they pray, healings occur. When they seek God, they receive words of knowledge and visions. When they intercede, the Holy Spirit gives them a special sp spiritual language to storm heaven and to see answers to their intercession. And this is what happens on the day of Pentecost. In chapter 2 and verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples, all 120 of them, in such power but, but that by the end of that day, 3,000 people have committed their lives to Christ. So you might be asking, um, Bethany, so how come our Bible re reading this morning is in Acts 2, the story of Pentecost? Why did Sheila read Acts 4? It's a good question. And the reason is because being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-off occurrence. Remember Ephesians 5.18 and that the instruction to be filled with the Holy Spirit is in the continuous present tense. To be being kept continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. And for this series, we are picturing this spirit-filled life, this ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit, like a sail being filled with the wind. And so in the passage of Acts 4 that, that Sheila read, we see how Peter and John and all the other disciples and followers of Jesus are filled again with the Spirit. And of course, Peter and John, well, they've been two of the main leaders on the day of Pentecost. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Then it's Peter who'd st stood up and preached and 3,000 became saved. And yet here they are again, being filled with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit so that they could continue the work that, that God had commissioned them to, to, to do. Even in light of all the persecution, that they could speak boldly, that they could pray and see people healed, that, that lives would be changed, people would be set free, and the, the nations are going to be impacted by the gospel. And the truth is that this repeated filling of the Spirit is mentioned again and again throughout the New Testament. Do you remember how Stephen was chosen to distribute the food to those in needs because, and it says, he was full of the Spirit and wisdom. And then we read on the day of his death that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. His being full of the Holy Spirit wasn't a one-time occurrence. Likewise, Paul experienced many occasions of being filled with the Spirit. Three days after his conversion on the road to Damascus, Ananias is sent to go and speak to Paul, Saul as he was still called then, share words of prophecy, pray for his eyes to be healed, and to impart a filling of the Holy Spirit. If you like to be baptised for the first time into the power of God. But in Acts chapter 13, when Paul is sent off on his first missionary journey, we are told that he is sent off by the Holy Spirit. And then again, um, he is filled with the Holy Spirit when he encounters the magician on the island of Cyprus. So what can we say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, 
we, we really need to be very careful about putting God in a box of our own human creation and understanding, because just as everyone's salvation story is different, so everyone's encounter with the power of God alive in them is also different. But the term baptism is often, not always, but often used to describe that first time that the power of God comes upon someone in such a measure that they feel it, they know it, and they realise something's changed. God has now given me his power. And when I witness for him, people respond. So a kind of general theme is that those who've experienced a filling of the God of the Holy Spirit experience his power and then go on to become witnesses, witnesses with the power of God that makes difference. And this is very much what is emphasised in, in both the Pentecostal, the charismatic movements. They have a real experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon them in a way that enables them to proclaim Jesus with a power and conviction that they'd never had before. This is what my pastor Paul experienced for several years, about five years. They'd had this tiny house group that never really grew more than 15 people. Except until he was baptised in the Spirit. And then he kept preaching exactly the same gospel that he preached before. But after being baptised, people began to respond. They were saved and the church began to grow. Priscilla, Paul's wife, was given a powerful gift of prophecy and they began to see miracles of healing and provision in their small congregation that grew to be 800 and then a thousand people. Have you ever heard of the story of Jackie Pullinger? She's one of my great heroes of the faith. Well, she moved to Hong Kong and began befriending drug addicts and triad gang members. After about two years, she was there and she felt she was getting absolutely nowhere. Not one single person had come to Christ. And then she was baptised in the Spirit. Within weeks, she saw the difference. She was doing exactly the same. She was speaking the same message. But now people were being saved and drug addicts were being healed. So when does this baptism or this filling up with the power of the Holy Spirit occur? It can happen at salvation. It can happen when baptized, believers are baptised in water. It can happen in your own living room or in church or on the street. It can happen at any time. Will this filling always be as dramatic as Pentecost with tongues of fire and a mighty wind? Well, sometimes that does happen, uh, but very often not. Everyone's experience will be different. But what is unmistakable is that it is an encounter with the Spirit of God. An encounter that changes you. An encounter that changes kind of the world around you. Because you see the difference that God makes. However, the crucial point that we're focusing on in this series is that our encounter with God the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. We are encouraged to continually seek God and to be filled always with the Spirit. You know, and let, let's be honest, the experience of God's people through history shows that sometimes that is a big outpouring, like it was for the disciples in first the passage at Pentecost and then the next passage that Sheila read in Acts 4. But at other times, it is a, a matter of faithfully walking each day, opening your life up and saying, God, fill me with your spirit for what I need for today. Hmm, what analogies might help us here to understand it? Well, it is not a perfect picture, but think of a crop, um, a field of, a, of, of wheat or something like that. You know, to grow the crop, it needs water. Now, a wise farmer will know that there are two ways his crop can be watered. One is to rely on the rain, a lovely, heavy downpour from the skies that will cover the whole field with plenty of water soaking deep into the earth and providing that crop with the essential high water volume that's needed. Absolutely perfect. But what if the field is located in a hot climate? where rainfall is only occasional and yet daily watering is needed. 
Well, then an irrigation system is required. The irrigation system taps into a local spring that will fill, feed the field with fairly small amounts of water, but regularly, every day, enough to keep the crops thriving until the next heavy downpour. You know, and so it is with our walk with God. We experience an encounter with God where the Holy Spirit comes upon us and anoints us with power. And then we seek the filling of the Holy Spirit each day to walk faithfully with him. There will be times and occasions when by his grace, he then pours out again the Holy Spirit upon us and we receive a bigger filling up for that particular occasion or that season in life. But very often, we then seek him every single day for him to fill us with the Holy Spirit for what we need. And that has been my experience. I was baptised in the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old and first began speaking in tongues. But then there have been many times since when I have been filled with the Spirit and given a fresh power of God to be a witness for Christ. It occurred at my water baptism when I was 10 years old and when I began sharing the gospel with others. There was an occasion when I was 12 and led a group of kids, other kids, to faith in Jesus Christ. There was that time in Belfast when a group of children asked me to start a Bible club in my home to tell them about Jesus. In February 2018, the week just before John became ill and I somehow ended up the pastor of Rosedale, I was filled with the Holy Spirit afresh at a meeting at Soul Survivor. And you know what? There was a time just a few weeks ago when I was on a prayer walk seeking God and suddenly felt the Holy Spirit upon me with a power to intercede for others. Does this mean I only sense the Holy Spirit at those big filling times? No. By faith, I know the Holy Spirit is always with me. I do not doubt his presence and I always have an awareness of my Lord because every day, with my Bible open and on my knees in prayer, with meditation and conversations. I trust and know that I'm being filled for this day and what this day will bring. So where are we going with this baptism bit of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, really, I guess it comes down to whether, like my Pastor Paul, you want all that God has got for you. When God promised to give his Holy Spirit to his people in Joel chapter 2 verse 28, this is what he said. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And that promise has never been rescinded. The promise is for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon us, his people. The how will be different for each one, but it is a power that belongs to him that will equip us with the gifts and what we need to change our lives and also to give us the power to be effective witnesses for Christ in our neighbourhoods to those around us. Is this what you long for? I do. And in these difficult times in January 2021, when it is so tough, you know, we need the power of God like never before. Perhaps you'd like to pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are the great and mighty God who's moved in power since before the beginning of time. You promised to pour out your spirit on all your people and I am yours. Please fill me again with your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, this morning for my brothers and sisters, those who are hungering for a fresh anointing, those who want to be baptised, totally immersed, maybe for the first time in the spirit of your power. Please, will you fall upon them right now? Come, Holy Spirit. Meet them where they are in their living rooms this morning. And may they encounter you afresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I would encourage you this morning to get on your knees and seek the Lord and all that he has for you. Because he promises that those who seek him will find him.
he will meet with you. Please know I'm available if you want to talk further about these things to discuss more scriptures or pray together. We can do that by phone or by Zoom. Do get in touch. God bless you. I'll see you next week.